This is Space Time, Series 23, Episode 55. Coming up on Space Time. Earth's magnetic field continuing to weaken. New results raising more questions about the foundations of the cosmos. And the Dobsonian Telescope, an astronomical observatory for the masses. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A new study shows Earth's magnetic field is continuing to weaken around the South Atlantic anomaly, an area stretching from Africa to South America, which some scientists have speculated could signify the start of a flip in Earth's magnetic polarity. New data from the European Space Agency Swarm Constellation shows the strange behaviour is continuing to increase, and it has geophysicists puzzled. The South Atlantic anomaly has been a problem for satellites for decades. Spacecraft flying through this area are more likely to experience technical malfunctions as the shield provided by Earth's magnetic field is weaker in this region, allowing charged particles from the Van Allen radiation belts, as well as the Sun and cosmic rays, to penetrate deeper down into the atmosphere. In fact, NASA is forced to shut down operations with the Hubble Space Telescope when it orbits through this area. Satellites have been known to go haywire, and even laptops used by astronauts aboard the International Space Station have been known to suddenly crash above the anomaly. But the implications are far more global. Earth's magnetic field is vital for life on our planet. It's a complex and dynamic force that protects life from cosmic radiation and charged particles from the Sun. The magnetic field is largely generated by an ocean of superheated swirling liquid iron that makes up the Earth's outer core, some 3,000 kilometres beneath the planet's surface. Acting as a spinning conductor in a dynamo, it generates electrical currents, which in turn generate a continuously changing electromagnetic field. And this field is far from static, varying in both strength and direction. For example, as we reported last month, Recent studies have shown the position of the North Magnetic Pole is changing rapidly, moving from Arctic Canada towards Siberia at an ever-increasing rate. Scientists and navigators have been noticing this drift ever since Magnetic North was first measured back in 1831. However, since the 1990s, what was a slow drift has been speeding up, going from an historic wandering of no more than around 15 kilometres per year up to its present-day speed of up to 60 kilometres a year. Over the last 200 years, Earth's magnetic field has lost around 9% of its strength on global average. And from 1970 till now, the minimum field strength of the South Atlantic anomaly has dropped from around 24,000 nanoteslas to just 22,000, while at the same time, the area of the anomaly has grown, and it's been moving westwards at around 20 kilometres a year. Over the past five years, a second centre of minimum intensity has emerged just southwest of Africa, and that suggests that the South Atlantic anomaly could be splitting up into two separate cells. Earth's magnetic fields often visualised as a powerful dipolar bar magnet, the centre of the planet, tilted at around 11 degrees to the axis of rotation. However, the growth of the South Atlantic anomaly suggests that the processes involved in generating the field are far more complex than that. Simple dipolar models are unable to account for the recent development of the second minimum. Scientists are using data from the Swarm constellation to better understand this anomaly. The Swarm satellites are designed to identify and precisely measure the different magnetic signals that make up Earth's magnetic field. Jürgen Matzke from the German Research Center for Geosciences says the new eastern minimum for the South Atlantic anomaly has appeared over the past decade, and in recent years it's been developing vigorously. The challenge now is to understand the processes in Earth's core which are driving these changes. It's been speculated that the current weakening of the field could be a sign that Earth's heading for an imminent pole reversal, in which the North and South magnetic poles switch places. The Sun goes through polar reversals just like this every 11 years. And similar polarity reversals have occurred on numerous occasions throughout Earth's history, roughly every 250,000 years or so. However, according to the geological record, the last flip was some 770,000 years ago, which means, based on past history, we're well and truly overdue for the next. Based on past evidence, 
Life survives these flips fairly well. There's nothing in the geological record to suggest any sudden increase in cancer rates or species diversification due to increased radioactivity from the sun getting through to the Earth's surface. Of course, none of the past flips of Earth's polarity have involved modern-day technology. Think about things like blown transformers and overloaded power lines. Sure, you can replace one or two transformers if they go off the grid, but what happens if globally thousands of transformers suddenly blow? The good news is that the intensity of the dip in the South Atlantic anomaly is still well within what's considered normal levels of fluctuation, at least for now. But it might not be a bad idea to stock up on candles just in case, and possibly also toilet paper. This is Space Time. Still to come, new results raising new questions about our understanding of the foundations of the cosmos and the Chinese Internet of Things placed in orbit. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Scientists analysing data from subatomic particle collisions have been getting some strange results which seem to be pointing towards some mysterious new physics. Physicists with the LHCB collaboration at CERN, the European Organisation for Nuclear Research, are trying to understand the new results, which are raising some serious questions about certain aspects of the standard model. The standard model is the foundation of science's understanding of the universe, and anything that deviates from it has the potential to open up new physics, which could explain things like dark matter and dark energy. The scientists have been analysing new data about the decay of rare subatomic particle known as a B meson. The specific type of meson in question comprises a down quark and a bottom antiquark. Quarks are elemental subatomic particles and a fundamental constituent of matter. They combine to form composite particles known as hadrons, the most stable of which are baryons, such as protons and neutrons, which each have three quarks and often make up the nucleus of atoms. But quarks can also exist in pairs in less stable particles known as mesons. There are six known types of quarks, called flavours. Up, down, top, bottom, sometimes called beauty, charm and strange. Up and down quarks have the lowest masses and they're the most stable. The proton is composed of two up quarks and a down quark, while the neutron is made up of one up quark and two down quarks. Heavier quarks rapidly change into up and down quarks through a process of particle decay, the transformation from a higher mass state down to a lower mass state. Because of their stability, up and down quarks are the most common type of quark in the universe, whereas charm, strange, top and bottom quarks can usually only be produced in high energy collisions, like those involving cosmic rays, or in particle accelerators. And for every quark flavour, there's a corresponding antimatter counterpart, or an antiquark that differs only in that some of its properties have equal magnitude but opposite sign. The new CERN analysis, which is interesting scientists, is based on twice as many B downquark meson decays as previous LHCB analyses. See, scientists were looking for a rare event in which a B downquark meson decays into a kaon. That's another type of meson made up of a strange quark and a down quark and a pair of muons, which are unstable, heavier versions of electrons. The standard model predicts that this is a rare one-in-a-million event. But it's worth looking for, because some hypotheses suggest new unknown particles could be involved, contributing to the decay and causing a change in the rate at which the decay occurs. Furthermore, the distribution of the angles of the decay products from the original B down quark meson could also be affected by the presence of the new particles. In previous studies of this decay, the authors analysed data from the first run of the Large Hadron Collider, the world's largest atom smasher, and found a significant deviation from the standard model's predictions in the distribution of these angles. In the new study, the authors added data from the Large Hadron Collider's second run to their analysis and found that not only was the deviation in the distribution angle still there, but now other strange issues are starting to show up as well. LHCB physics coordinator Matt Charles says it's a very exciting time to be doing what's known as flavour physics. He says the scientists are seeing moderate tensions in the standard model. They still don't know how this mystery will turn out. In fact, nothing has yet reached a level of solid proof. 
but you can be sure they're looking forward to the next round of results using the full LHCB dataset, which will roughly double the number of events for analysis. For now, scientists say it's still too early to tell if the deviation is just a statistical anomaly or if it's real, and if so, whether it's caused by some new as-yet-unknown particle or mysterious force. But the thing is, it is unusual, and that makes it interesting. And who knows, it could eventually open a new window on the universe. This is Space Time. Still to come, China's Internet of Things satellite placed in orbit, and we look at the Dobsonian Telescope, an astronomical observatory for the masses. All that and more still to come on Space Time. China has successfully launched a pair of Internet of Things communications satellites. The Jing-1, 2, 0, 1 and 0, 2 spacecraft were launched aboard a Kaozhu 1A solid fueled rocket from the Zhaiquang Satellite Launch Center in northwestern China's Ganshu Province. The satellites will be used to conduct tests on technologies including space-based Internet of Things data relay communications, as well as inter-satellite laser communication systems, as part of an eventual constellation of 80 low-Earth orbit Internet of Things telecom satellites. OK, let's talk telescopes. And one of the most popular types of telescopes around right now is a type of reflector known as a Dobsonian. They're popular because they're really easy to make and they're just about the biggest light bucket you can get for any given price. And as Jonathan Nally, the editor of Australian Sky Telescope magazine, explains, you can pretty well make them out of almost anything you've got lying around the garage doesn't matter what your hobby is or what your interest is, everyone has a project that gets half done and then gets shoved away in a cupboard somewhere and just forgotten for years and years and years. You've seen my model train set, have you? <laughs> I know all about your model train set. <laughs> yeah, we take a look at a homemade telescope that was started in the 1970s but has only just been finished, wow. if you can believe it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a style of telescope called a Dobsonian, which is a very famous style of telescope now, but back in the 1970s it was a brand new thing. It's named after an American astronomer, John Dobson, who was actually never really really happy about having a telescope named after him, but, you know, it stuck, and that was the end of it. And he came up with this idea, uh, actually in the late 1960s, and it's as simple as you can get. You just get a cheap tube for the telescope. You fit a box around the tube, and you put a couple of axles on the side of that box, and you rest that inside of another box that can take the axles. And so your, your telescope tube inside its box can tilt up, up and down, um, resting inside this second box. And the second box, you put a swivel thing on the bottom of it, so you can swivel from left to right. Dead easy, and Dobson's idea was to, as much as possible, just use scrap. Get some scrap wood, or, you know, just find a tube, a cardboard tube, or any sort of tube you can get your hands on, anything cheap and easy, uh, and just, just build something, you know. And what is it, two mirrors or, or um, a lens? Just, or? Just, just a mirror, just a, a traditional reflecting telescope, a, a curved mirror down the far end, which um, makes the light come to a focus up towards the front of the tube, and then you just put a little flat mirror in the in the middle of the, the tube up the front, and that, ben that, that bounces case. the light out to the mm. side, out, out, out through a hole in the side of the tube, and you look through that. So really cheap, simple, easy. Two mirrors, that's it, second-hand parts. So um, our, our project or our, our article in Australian Sky and Telescope is this telescope that was begun in the 1970s because John Dobson used to hold classes for people uh, in, in America. He used to have you know, neighbourhood workshops and show people how to build telescopes and lots of people did build telescopes under his tutelage. This particular one was begun in one of those workshops but didn't get finished, never got finished. So uh, one of our authors um, was, managed to get his hands on this scope, this partially completed thing, and he's finished it off. And he's finished it off, I have to say, in true 1970 style. It's got flower power symbols and Carnaby Street colours all over it. <laughs> it's, 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 Someone uh, obviously it, had too much time during their seclusion at home due to COVID-19. It looks so bad, it looks good. Um, it's it's real HR puff and stuff type mm -hmm. um, <laughs> type uh, colours and things. It really is great, but yeah, it, it's exactly what it was meant to be: a cheap and easy to build telescope, and anyone can build one of these things. Uh, they're they're so easy, and you can just use cheap stuff to build them with. 
and get yourself going. So uh, watch Delphi reruns Jones of the Fox Partridge Fox. Family. Partridge Family. Yep, yep. That's Jonathan Ali, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. And don't forget, if you're having trouble getting your copy of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine from your usual retailer because of the current lockdown and travel restrictions, you can always get a print or digital subscription and have the magazine delivered directly to your letterbox or inbox. Subscribing's easy. Just go to skytelescope.com.au. That's skytelescope.com.au and you'll never be left in the dark again. This is Space Time. Still to come, the Science Report, where we'll look at growing fears that COVID-19 could be transmitted through the eyes, and new evidence showing that parts of the eastern highlands of Victoria are still growing. All that and much more still to come on Space Time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. There are growing fears that COVID-19 could be transmitted through the eyes. A new study on the preprint server BioArchive claims high concentrations of ACE2 receptors have been found in the eye. These molecules have already been identified as the entry points for the virus causing the COVID-19 pandemic. The receptors are also found in the nose, throat, lungs, heart, kidneys and small intestines, all of which have proven to be prime targets for COVID-19 infections. Researchers led by the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine found the eyes produce ACE2, making them a target for the virus. It means that if droplets from an infected person sneeze or cough or even speech were to land on the surface of your eye, the virus could begin to infect cells there. Scientists have found eye-expressed ACE2 in the conjunctiva tissue that lines the inside of the eyelids, the clear outer layer of the eye, called the cornea, and the border between the cornea and the white of the eye, called the imbus. In fact, scientists have previously reported the presence of the virus in ocular fluids, leading to conjunctive inflammation. It's long been assumed that continental Australia is an ancient land, with little significant geological activity today, such as mountain range building. But a new study by the University of Melbourne has found that parts of the eastern highlands of Victoria are still growing. Researchers have discovered that ongoing uplifting of New Zealand's southern Alps is increasing stress and strain on the Australian tectonic plate, triggering earthquakes and lifting parts of Victoria which may be as young as 5 million years, rather than the 90 million years originally thought. Uranium-lead dating of stalagmite, stalactite and flowstone samples collected from caves suggest that the area has been steadily uplifting at a rate of around 76 metres every million years for at least the last 3.5 million years, and is continuing today. Russia's new Zircon hypersonic cruise missile is about to undertake its first underwater test launch. The flight will follow the current test series now being undertaken by the Russian frigate Admiral Gorshkov in the Barents Sea, which is home to Russia's northern fleet. The tests have now been successfully hitting their targets in the northern Urals. The new underwater test will be the first submarine launch for the 10-metre-long scramjet-powered cruise missile, which has been given the NATO codename SSN-33. Capable of carrying a 400-kilogram warhead at speeds of over 11,100 kilometres per hour, that's Mach 9, by the way, the Zircon is one of about half a dozen or so strategic weapons now being developed by Moscow to evade American missile defence systems. The Zircon is believed to be a highly manoeuvrable winged hypersonic cruise missile with a lift-generating centre body. It's launched using a solid rocket engine boost stage, which accelerates the Zircon to supersonic speeds, after which a liquid-fueled scramjet second stage takes over, accelerating it through to hypersonic speeds. Intelligence suggests it has an operational low-level range of over 500 kilometres and a high-level ballistic range of more than 1,000 kilometres. It'll initially be deployed aboard Kirov-class battle cruisers, as well as the new Husky-class fifth-generation nuclear submarines, which are now under development. A land-based version of the Zircon's also under development, and prototypes have also been test-launched from Tupolev Tu-22M backfire supersonic swing-wing bombers. Scientists have described a colourful new species of velvet gecko from the Northern Territory's Groot Island. A report in the journal Zootaxia claims this new species is only found on the remote island in the Gulf of Carpentaria. 
A large colourful animal features white bands and yellow spots and lives in rock crevices. However, perhaps even more striking than the adults are the babies, which are black with bright white bands. Well, it seems when it comes to pseudoscientific trash, some people and organisations simply can't get enough ridicule for their lack of knowledge and proper research. Take the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, the ABC, for example. More than a billion dollars of taxpayer money is thrown at the broadcaster every year. Yet on three occasions now, they've won the Australian Skeptic Spent Spoon Award as the perpetrator of the most preposterous piece of paranormal or pseudoscientific piffle. And while their triple crown and the glory and honour associated with the bed spoon is safe for now, other contenders are circling. But of course, it takes a lot to be given the bent spoon. You need to be pushing some pretty low standards in order to outdo everyone else in the country. Yet, as Tim Menham from Australian Skeptics points out, a number of past winners now appear to be top contenders for the glittering prize of the 2020 bent spoon. Australian Skeptics has been issuing its Ben Spoon Award for 38 years. We've been around for 40 years, so pretty early on in the piece we decided to give it an award named in honour of the infamous Yuri Geller. The Ben Spoon Award drew what is the deep breath perpetrator of the most preposterous piece of paranormal or pseudoscientific piffle. So you guys words, say it that way deliberately to make it tough for announcers like me. Absolutely, yeah, of course so, yeah, because we are so alliterative that we do that. Uh, well, basically, then they allow us to say it rather than you guys say it. And it's basically to the, the, the most ridiculous, idiotic claim of the year. A lot of them have been in the paranormal area, you know, ghosts and psychics and love. But especially more recently, there's been a lot of medical and uh, anti-science winners of it. So in 38 years, we've given it to 38 different people or groups or whatever. The ABC is one of the few times, by the way. Yeah, um, and yes. And SBS. <laughs> but it's never actually been given to the same person twice. There is a lot of competition for this award, I should add, unfortunately. But lately, you know, this year, and it's only sort of not even halfway through the year, we're all get, really building up a good uh, cohort of candidates. There's been a number of people who have won the award in the past who are now sort of throwing their hat in the ring again. But the classic one is Pete Evans, the Pete Paleo Pete, the chef who is anti-vaccination, anti-fluoride, full of pseudoscience. He won it in 2015 for his paleo diet, amongst various things. But just this year, he's been promoting, well, was promoting a product called a biocharger machine. A biocharger. $15,000 for a, what is basically a Tesla coil inside a few fluorescent tubes, and it makes pretty colours, right? Um, okay. And yeah. according to him, you could tune it to create frequencies and harmonics. That's his term, not mine. That is beneficial for a huge range of ailments, including... Including coronavirus. Sounds like he's been channeling Peter Brock almost. <laughs> yeah, well, Peter Brock won. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh he did. <laughs> he did, yeah, way back when. Peter Brock's harmonizer. Yes. Um, for the, for a little thing you glue on the firewall of your car, apparently, and make it go faster. It didn't work, but. You wrapped it around a fuel line and it increased your oh, fuel is, efficiency. Is that how it worked? Yes, I know. No, but it didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> no one escapes the skeptic Spence Moon. So <laughs> he's, he was promoting this. He has taken it down off his website, but he has just been fined by the Therapeutic Goods Administration about $25,000 for promoting it, which is not a lot of money. It's basically two, two of the buyer charges, but he, he gets away with it because he's charming, got a big smile, and uh, used to he's on TV. He's sort of the male version of Gwyneth Paltrow almost, isn't he? To a certain extent, but nowhere near as, uh, as organised to as big business as Gwyneth is. Had Gwyneth been in Australia, she would be very much a good candidate for the Ben Spoon, but we only give it to people in Australia. We have enough of our own, thank you. Meryl Dory, who used to be running it was probably still does run the Australian Vaccination Network, which is anti-vaccination network and goes under various names, has been promoting conspiracy theories lately about the claims about uh, the coronavirus. She's one of the people who regards it as, as a hoax, the pandemic as a hoax. Fran Sheffield from Homeopathy Plus, which is a, pr a promoter of homeopathy. Mr. Sheffield! Mr. Sheffield! She won in 2012 for promoting, I think at the time, uh, homeopathy as a cure for Ebola and a range of other things as well. She's now suggesting the same thing that homeopathy can cure COVID-19. And then, of course, there's uh, Judy Weilerman, who was won the Ben Spoon in 2016 for probably one of the worst PhD theses ever, ever. Oh, this uh, is the Wollongong awarded, University person. Wollongong University. They should have been ashamed of themselves. I'm sure they were, actually. They were embarrassed by it. The, a PhD about the vaccination industry and the involvement of governments and the 
World Health Organization and the United Nations and everybody else who's consp- conspiring against you. She's back online saying that social distancing and the banning of gatherings are not necessary in this current outbreak. The interesting thing is whenever you confront these people, they tend to quickly take these things down and deny they ever said them. Fortunately, these days, people can save videos and Facebook pages, whatever, and they can point them out saying, yes, you did say it, and this is what you said. So these people who have all won the Ben Spoon in the past, all in the last 10 years, are really going for it again. They'd really like to win again. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. And that's the show for now. Space Time is broadcast on Science Zone Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and through both iHeartRadio and on TuneIn Radio. Or you can subscribe and download Space Time as a free podcast through Apple, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, Spotify, YouTube, Audioboom, Podbeam, Android, Castbox, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite download podcast provider. You can help support the show and the work we do by visiting the Spacetime online shop and grabbing yourself a few goodies, or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to commercial-free double-episode versions of the show, as well as bonus audio content and other rewards. Just go to our Patreon page through SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com for all the details. If you want more space time, check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lower case, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 